Ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you please to uh, move to your seats? Good afternoon. If I could have your attention, please. Um, my name is Nicholas Rostow. I'm the senior director of the Center for Strategic Research at the Institute for National Strategic Studies. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's discussion of um, sub-regional contributions to hemispheric security. And um, we have uh, three uh, presenters this afternoon. Uh, Professor Claypack of the um, Royal Military College of Canada, uh, General Braga Neto of the Brazilian Armed Forces and uh, Military Attaché to the United States and Canada, and uh, uh, Provost uh, Ivlaw Griffith, Provost of York College of the City University of New York. I thought that what we should do is to allow our presenters about an hour. I will not be too mean, but I will be, if you start wandering over 20 minutes, I shall uh, hit you with something. And um, uh, so that we can have plenty of time for discussion and questions and answers. And without further ado, Professor Claypack. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the invitation to the organizers. Again, being given first place after lunch is a, a bit of a challenge, but we'll see if we can keep you vaguely awake. Um, I'm a historian, and I'm a Canadian. I think we're probably overrepresented in Canada at this meeting, and we're very grateful uh, to be so. Um, but I will have a different approach, perhaps, than some of the ones that, we were going to, that you're going to be hearing. And uh, I would like to start with uh, reiterating, I think, something that's become uh, traditional for today, if something can become traditional for a day, and that is there's a lot of positive things. If we're looking back at 30 years, or uh, as the ambassador, as Ambassador Ayanaudi said, if we're talking about uh, anniversaries in general, when we look back, it wasn't very long ago when we would be looking at a very unpleasant uh, international inter-American scene indeed uh, on the de specifically defense and security civil military relations anchoring and democracy confidence building and we could go through a long list and now very happily we have a region which is truly a contributor to international peace. Restal recently did a study in Buenos Aires which showed that since 2001, the world increase in uh, contributions to international peacekeeping has gone up 119%. The Latin American contribution in the same period has gone up by 748%. So we're talking about a very different region, and I'll come back to that, perhaps on not such positive uh, terms uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. Um, I'd like to step back, as all historians do for a moment, and say just something about, from my perspective, uh, the philosophical side of this. Uh, we're talking about defense and security cooperation. And as was mentioned about interagency cooperation, even within a united country, uh, defense and security cooperation among nations has never been easy or automatic in any way, shape, or form. It's forced on us most of the time uh, by events. It's not a reality. As Jomini refers in Précis de de la Guerre, every ally wants to do the least and get the most credit and have his little bit be the decisive bit. Uh, now, everybody can't get that. 
out of an alliance, somebody's got to do something for the alliance uh, to succeed. And if that's true in wartime, it's perhaps more true in peacetime where the urgency of cooperation obviously is not in any way uh, the same, or perhaps uh, we hope it isn't. Um, and defense is also the realm of lots of things which pull you back from cooperation. Nations. Uh, nations are jealous of one another. Uh, security and defense talks about secrets, about things we not, don't necessarily want people to know, about weaknesses and vulnerabilities, which we certainly don't want someone who might be an enemy of ours uh, one day to know about. It's not in any way um, automatic. And if you then add to that the fact that in the defense business, what we do is worst case planning. We don't do best case planning. If there's no fire, I don't need a fire brigade. It's because there might be a fire that I need a fire brigade and I have to prepare for it. This is about worst case planning. None of that pushes you automatically to sharing ideas, to opening yourself up, etc. So I think it's always worthwhile to look at the uh, positive side. If you get anything going, uh, that's uh, quite good. But of course, as has already been remarked today, in the hemisphere, this is a pretty odd basis for cooperation. Why would a hemisphere cooperate? If anyone suggested that the northern hemisphere should do things together because it's the northern hemisphere, you'd be out, laughed out of the room. If anyone suggested the eastern hemisphere should be cooperating in, in defense and security, people wouldn't know what you were talking about. So that there's something else that's added here, and it's another question mark, which I think we're having more and more uh, in the hemisphere uh, at the moment as we uh, redefine uh, things. It's not an obvious rubric for cooperation and particularly uh, for defense and security operation as we, uh, cooperation as we don't share a, the same language or the same religion or the same history or all of the same uh, cultural values, although we share, I hope, a great deal. I think also, of course, and this is no surprise for anyone in this audience, we have history. There's no tabula rasa here. There's a lot of very unpleasant background. And the more we try to ignore it, the less we're going to achieve. But at the same time, we've got to turn our backs to it at some stage if we're going to get on about the business of defense cooperation. So that I think that's unfortunately or fortunately, that's what we face. It's not easy initially, and we have specific reasons to this hemisphere, which makes it perhaps a little more uh, dangerous as well. Um, despite this, and I'll get on a hobby horse for just a moment. Despite this, we have shining examples. We have some shining examples, perhaps not hemispheric, but specifically that uh, Admiral Atkins has just shared with us. But I think if I may be excused for talking about United States history for a moment, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have a remarkably clear-cut example of when it works really well. And when it works really well, if I look back, in 1917, when, for very good reasons of attacks on the United States shipping, Washington decides to declare war on some of the central powers, it is joined by absolutely no one in Latin America except countries that are directly occupied by United States forces at their moment. Brazil later enters the war, but for its own reasons. No one. In 1941, when Pearl Harbor uh, is attacked, Within three months, the whole of Latin America, with the exception of Argentina, Chile, for very specific reasons, the whole of the hemisphere either has broken relations and declared war on the Axis powers, or at least has broken relations with them and joined in economic embargoes, etc. What's that all about? In my view, it's about the good neighbor policy. It's about mutual respect. And it's about eight years of not a single military intervention anywhere in the region and the withdrawal of United States forces from every country in the region. That has sent a message. By the way, it's also about uh, a strong support for deep reform, socially as well as political, and for democracy in general. Those are the tenets of United States policy for eight years. And the payoff is dramatic and immediate. I think there might be a lesson for us all, not just for the United States uh, in that. Alas, that, uh, oh yes, and I would just perhaps like to remind us that in 1945, as a result of that, those eight years, but also the four years of cooperation, the result is that it is the Latin American nations at Chapultepec in the spring of 1945 that ask for a peacetime defense relationship with the United States. It is not the United States that bludgeons Latin America into something they don't want. 
It is on the request of Latin America, including Mexico, interestingly enough, that the United States accedes somewhat to its disbelief to a peacetime alliance with partners that are not exactly uh, traditional for it. So there's a lot of success behind hemispheric cooperation. When we start to look at it uh, negatively, we should keep that uh, in mind. I don't have to tell this audience that the Cold War, of course, destroys a huge amount of this positive uh, relationship. I think from my own perspective, through an exaggerated view of the chances of the region going, uh, becoming a security threat for the United States, uh, but we could talk about that at another time. Uh, whatever the results of that are over the years, ho however negative, nonetheless in the 90s, as the United States is looking over other treaty arrangements and other defense and security rela uh, relationships, it comes up with the idea of reevaluating the one in the Americas as well. And the rather dramatic, in my view, uh, series of conferences of, the, uh, of defense ministers of the Americas, something we've never thought about before, foreign ministers, sure but defense ministers, that process begins first to be annually and then to be uh, biannually as people get frightened of fatigue of conferences. And that seems all very positive. What's happened? Well, it seems to me that we're talking about a transformed situation, and I think that's what most speakers have been referring to uh, this morning. We're talking about a Miami consensus that is now ancient history. We're talking about not only several proposals for where the hemisphere should be going, but some proposals which are contradictory to others. And then, of course, some proposals which don't include the idea of a rubric of hemisphere at all, that reject the very idea that the hemisphere would be the basis on which your central elements, perhaps certain elements, but your central elements of how you want to face the future uh, are structured. As Ambassador Rinaldi said as well, we have geo geographic board, uh, breakdown, this extraordinary moment where, uh, perhaps with the exception of Colombia, we seem to have this dreadful divide uh, stretching across uh, the hemisphere between South America on the one hand and, and North America, but even that, or North America and Central America and the Caribbean, Mexico. And in any case, uh, whatever that uh, leads to, it leads to uh, a divide which is visible, palpable. Um, secondly, of course, that geographical divide is supplemented, confused by an ideological divide with Alba stretching across that geographical divide, but nonetheless uh, an ideological divide between uh, left-leaning, the pink tide, if you prefer that term, uh, in, Latin, in much of Latin America, and certainly uh, changes which are of a dramatic kind, I think reflecting essentially a success of United States policy that we really do have democracies in the region that are functioning. If the masses really had no role, if there was never a leftist press, if there were never real political parties that could produce an option for change, we now do have those. And they do propose or present problems uh, for a conservative uh, order in uh, the region. Well, in defense and security, those divisions, as we've seen today, are as clear as ever. The U.S. had established, but with its allies, not uh, obliging people to get into a very large series of, uh, of institutions that we have in our region, uh, huge, you might argue, but very much closer to things we've seen in the rest of the world than, than experiences um, of NATO. Uh, NATO, I think it's still true that 54 percent of command positions are in, are in allied hands, uh, not United States hands. In the British Commonwealth, of course, we're very accustomed to New Zealand troops serving under the British, British troops serving under Canadians. It's very standard, whereas, of course, the experience here in the Americas was very much uh, sadder and very much uh, more uh, difficult. But we have the system. It's there. Its institutions are there. What seems to be the problem, it's very hard to be dynamic if you're a hemispheric organization that's divided by these huge ideological and geographical division. How do you get dynamism when the agreement to cooperate isn't there, and yet your institutions assume cooperation and consensus in, those, in that cooperation across now very significant uh, boundaries? Success, extraordinary. Admiral Atkins referred to some of them in the Caribbean, 
Uh, the Mexican uh, evolution is, for anyone my age, absolutely extraordinary, and Ambassador Rinaldi referred to it brilliantly this morning. Uh, we have a Mexico now that is not only no longer an observer to the CAA, and the Conference of American Armies, it is no longer now a member for the last few years, but is actually not only hosting the next cycle of the Conference of American Armies, but is, uh, but is hosting a second ad hoc emergency uh, meeting this fall uh, to, uh, about crime and armies, not about using armies against crime, but about what are the lessons learned of the various armies from their experience, something which we haven't, we haven't had yet, that Mexico could, to, could take this role and that the army, Sedena, could take this role with foreign ministry and, and Navy, maybe a bit of Navy jealousy uh, to some degree, but uh, certainly Navy uh, approval is really quite a, an exceptional step. So in North America, more cooperation than ever, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, d desire for cooperation that we can see extended in extraordinary ways as well um, uh, into the Caribbean on the specific issue of drugs but also spilling into other areas. Then of course in the south we have also very dramatic successes. UNASUR as has already been referred to has stepped into areas that are extraordinary that you should have a, confer uh, a, uh, a CDS, a Consejo de Defensa Sudamericano, that actually not only meets, but now has first-class academics and senior officers posted to it, that is sent up to the Council of Ministers, to which Ambassador Analdi referred, has, has sent up a strategic analysis, which is shared and signed on to by all defense ministers, including Guyana, and Suriname that has a strategic plan to a very, very limited level, no doubt, but nonetheless a strategic plan which is also signed on to for cooperation, for confidence building measures, something which we have certainly lost initiative uh, uh, in on the, uh, the inter-American level, and a whole slew of exercises and uh, natural disaster relief plans and things which we would normally, frankly, be doing at an inter-American level if we were doing them at all. You would, uh, you would argue. So dynamism is certainly there uh, in the South uh, on a, a number of scores. And ALBA as well, while at a much a less dramatic level, as you know, that when, when, uh, when Venezuela calls for an anti-American NATO, um, Cuba is the first to say, you must be out of your mind, and virtually everybody else joins in except uh, Nicaragua. So that uh, so that that tends to make you think that they're not doing anything in defense. In fact, they have uh, also meetings at ministerial level. They also have a new strategic studies center and a school which teaches, among other things, asymmetric uh, warfare, despite great differences, obviously, among them. I wouldn't want to exaggerate this. And reference has already been made to CFAC and to the uh, regional security system, CARICOM, and the rest of it. There's lots of things happening. Perhaps the clear uh, problem is that this isn't hemispheric. Uh, and is often made in entirely without reference uh, to hemispheric institutions or a hemispheric drive or objective in, in common. Yes, when you get together at the OAS, you have to say something polite about, yes, isn't this contributing to a wider security arrangement that we're all very happy with? But in the day-to-day -day and in, this, in, their, in one's own speeches among oneself, uh, there isn't much of that to be said. And then there's finally CELAC, which is probably uh, stretching, uh, stretching things a very long way to imagine the whole of Latin America with the Caribbean Central America and Mexico doing anything in defense and security, but I suppose we shall see. So, I only have four minutes. What is to be done? Um, I would suggest most of it's already been said um, in Frank Mora's uh, intervention and Ambassador Enaudi's. We need a ch mindset change. We've got a context change, which is obvious and dramatic. We need a mindset change, and I'm delighted that the terms that have been used today are, are about that. It seems to me that if we can understand that the old Latin America is gone, the old North America is gone as well, um, that there are nonetheless things that we want to do, that everybody agrees they want to do, as was referred to again a couple of times this morning. We have a list, not only in 2003, but at every conference after Williamsburg, that ever, well, that's not quite true, not at Bariloche, but at almost every conference since 1995, we have an agreed list of what we think the challenges are. Our problem is what approaches are we going to use to these problems, and what are the priorities that these problems enjoy? And there we have the devil in the detail uh, once, uh, once again. Well, 
By the way, the mindset has to change on the other side as well. Everything is not the United States' fault. I know that will come as an enormous surprise to you, but everything on Earth is not the United States' fault. It's a Canadian problem as well as a Latin American problem, so the mea culpa is ours as well. But everything, somebody somewhere has occasionally got to be naughty other than the people in the United States. And that requires uh, us to think that through as well. But I think it's worthwhile remembering that the North, if I may join both of us together, also with several other countries, there are a lot of things that still need to be done and that we can do, do together and that, in my view, can be, do, be done best at um, uh, an inter-American inter level. Modernizing armed forces and defense ministries. Lots of experience to share and even occasionally a little bit of money. Natural disasters, it's all very well to say there's been a lot of cooperation. The list of the, 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 the road to be uh, still um, built towards effective natural disaster cooperation in this hemisphere is still a very long one. And the resources tend to be northern, not southern. And we're talking about people here. Reform of security apparatus more generally. Handling the likely increase of the military role, even increase from where we are today on questions like crime, which we love to stick our heads in the ground about, but how to handle that in a context where people are not fearful for democracy, et cetera, it seems to be very important. Border control. Who knows more about borders than the United States does now? Smart borders technology. Improving timely use of, and improving and access to timely intelligence for all of the above. Uh, confidence building. We still haven't gone anywhere near as far as we need to. We can still do more in landmines. We still need to create that long desired defense community in most of the countries of the region. It hasn't been achieved in 17 years since the Argentines called for it uh, at the OAS. We're still a long way. The capacity for jointness in planning and training and operations, there's a lot that can be learned and can, one can help with. Expro improved exposure of the armed forces to new developments in strategy, tactics, technology, peacekeeping, high standards of training and technical skills in general, and uh, I suppose we could go on and on about that, so I'll, I'll stop there. But there are lots, there are lots of issues, it uh, seems to me. Um, if I may say then, it seems to me that, that where we should be going is building confidence. That's the first thing. The problem is history, history, history. Where we've come from and the poisoning of two generations of people who tend to be in, in power now about what United States interests are and now I think about Canadian interests as well. And we need to find shared interests. As I'm suggesting, there are plenty of them out there. But once we've done that, we have to inject dynamism. It's not going to come of its own. And that's going to require funding, it's going to require initiative, it's going to require human and, uh, and uh, material uh, resources. We've got to show that we're serious about cooperating and about doing things that are of mutual uh, interest. Um, Canada has been raised a couple of times uh, uh, today, and I think that while Canada and the United States agree, perhaps for the first time, on Latin American issues, and that, that makes defense and security cooperation important. I, at least, have been delighted to hear a constant reference, or at least twice on twice occasions today, to the question of Europe. The British, French, and Dutch are here territorially. They're not here for external issues to them. They are here, that's why they're interested, and despite the crisis, there are, they are anxious to play. And we, as has been said over and over again, like-minded countries have got to start being better uh, at cooperating. So I think also it, in that light with, with Europe, the other side of the Canadian question is, I think our greatest value, Mr. Chair, and I'll finish with that on the Canadian side, is that we have, I know that this is what Jay was expecting when he made that snide comment about the War of 1812, uh, the fact is that the War of 1812 is an extremely useful example. In 1938, not 1838, in 1938, when Canada and the United States signed their first ever bilateral defense arrangement of any kind, and it wasn't very dramatic, but Munich was coming, all sorts of nasty things were happening. When the leader of Her His Majesty's loyal opposition went down the steps of Kingston Town Hall and was interviewed by the local newspaper, he was asked, 1938, not 1838, what do you think about defense cooperation with the United States? And he replied without a pause, it makes me want to bring up my lunch. Uh, this has changed to very few decades later to the closest defense relationship in the world. 
Why? Mutual respect, common interests, working together. If we can find, it seems to me, that kind of recipe for the Americas as a whole, where we look at seriously what we think we still would like to do together, it's not going to be fighting the Cold War. It can't be fighting the Cold War, there ain't one. But it can be about a reduced number of things which are of common interest and where you could imagine uh, on that basis building a new cooperative system. And on that score, if our institutions work to provide that possibility, let's keep them. That may be my only disagreement, a tiny disagreement with Frank, uh, Frank Moore this morning. Uh, I think we absolutely should keep them if we can make them work. But if we can't make them work, we should keep in mind that the objective is not the institution. The objective is maintaining and enhancing defense and security cooperation in the Americas. If the institutions we've got ain't working, let's get some that do. Thank you very much. It's a very uh, uh, inspiring beginning to our conversation. Uh, General Braganetto. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, let me try here. All right. No? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> uh, when we were waiting there, I just want to apologize in advance for my, you know, I'm, English is not my mother tongue. Uh, I spent some time with the Australians, and then I can blame the, my Australian accent sometimes if you don't understand me, right? Please. As a good military, I have the support of these lights, and I will try to, to present to you exactly what is happening in Brazil about border security. All right, thank you. Uh, and don't worry, I don't want to bother you uh, very much. If it works. All right, please. OK, as a good military, these are my objectives. I cannot talk about security border in Brazil if I don't uh, were to say uh, Put Brazil exactly in his position. How is Brazil uh, in a world, in this, especially in South America? All right? Please, another one. Go ahead. Yeah. Then to do it, what I intend to do? Characteristic of the scenario, of course, where we are. All right. And the economist in 2009 was very happy when they put this in the cover, right? And you can have one idea about the Brazil nowadays. Imagine 2009, now 2012. Political instability, sustainable growth. One of the, we are the sixth economy in the world nowadays, going to be the fifth. And self-sufficient in water, food, and energy, right? OK. Then talking about border. Uh, to have one idea about how big and how big is the problem with our border, right? Then uh, one problem for me, it's exactly this, miles and kilometers. It's, uh, miles, no big deal, but foods each for Brazilians, it's terrible. Uh, one idea about our population here, you see, 200 million. The area, 47% of South America, the, our GDP, okay? and. We have, we have 12 countries, and Brazil has borders with 10 of these countries. Some borders are dry borders. What this means? That I'm here, and the gentleman on the other side, we are face to face, and he is in another country. We have farms in, uh, uh, when they, the government trying to check the cattle in this farm. They just change the <laughs> one side to the other. No, this cattle is in Paraguay, of course, my friend. <laughs> It's in Paraguay now, it's not yours. And we have the big coastline too. Okay, when we compare this border with the Americans, border with Mexico, to have one idea too, right? Then I believe it's, it's self-explained, right? And you have to, be, to keep in your mind that this border here, many times, is a jungle border, right? 
and to take care of the border is not an armed forces problem until 99. Right? All right. Then, about our concern with border and how the armed forces has to be prepared. We have nowadays, sorry, we have nowadays the Green Amazon. Oh, sorry. Can you come back one, please? Yes, another one. Yes, the Green Amazon, and now they call the uh, the, the, the platform, the continental platform, as the Blue Amazon. That you can, I believe that you heard about the um, Presau. I don't know how to translate in English, right? Uh, the petroleum on our coasts nowadays. All right. Let's talk about the Green Amazon. I'm not saying everything, but just pay attention here. You see? Uh, oh, shit. Sorry. <laughs> It's a lot of buttons. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> One back, please. They put many buttons here. Sorry. <laughs> All right. You can feel. One fifth of the Earth, fresh water. Water, you know, is a big problem for everybody, right? It's for Brazilians, two thirds of our hydroelectric reserves. And uh, it's only in the Amazon. Amazon have border with seven countries, right? The problem that we have in the Amazon, uh, I want to be clear that we don't have problem with borders. We have problems on the borders, right? And then in the Amazon, I have to take care to don't press the wrong button again. Uh, we have the traffic and contraband, such as weapons, and munitions, drug traf trafficking, smuggling, and especially environmental crimes, right? And what we can do it about it there? In 19, this is the reason that I talk about 1999. In 1999, here is not correct. Here is not the army, it's the armed forces, right? The government uh, give us one, one law that give the power, the, the, what I say, the um, law enforcement power to the armed forces, to patrolling, revision people, vehicles, ships, planes, and detention people in one, one, one lane around 150 kilometers from the border. The armed forces can do it. Usually the armed forces don't do it alone. We always work with other agencies, governmental agencies, especially the federal police and our Receita Federal. Uh, it's a, a mix of IRS and let me, I, I just take a note here. And your federal re revenue, they are in charge of uh, customs and internal revenue. It's w just one agency, and usually the armed forces work together with these agencies. Okay? Okay, where we are. Uh, this is about the army. I'm not talking about armed forces, right? This is now a situation nowadays, okay? You can check from, we have 27 brigades, 14 are on the border, and we have a lot of border platoons. And we have some detachments here in this area of west of Brazil. Usually this area is jungle, and this area is dry border, right? Okay. This is our brigades. I'm not. And what we do about cooperation and dissuasion? Actions create cooperation. Okay? Prevent the occurrence of illicit transnational activities to strengthen mutual confidence to persuade with adapt arguments, contention situations. How to do it? I will be more practical in a few minutes. But this is usually what people, all the armed forces on the border, in the uh, South America border do it, right? Humanitarian support and help, calamities, etc., in Brazil and other countries. Technical cooperation with other countries, all the uh, 
I, I, have, I can see here my friend from Paraguay, we have a lot of interaction. <laughs> Exchange knowledge and research. You see, oh, the, including the Paraguay people are here, right? We have a lot of students, not only with Brazil, but all, from Africa too, and other countries, Germany, but the, in, with countries from Europe usually are in more high level it's uh, like a school, uh, war the level of the war college or staff college. Joint exercise, we have a lot of joint <coughs> exercise. One example uh, for this vehicle here, uh, two years ago we um, helped the Paraguay with all the maintenance of these cars and then we provide all or everything for the, for, for the country when they need. We, are, we have a Paraguay platoon, a Canadian platoon are going to Haiti with us now, right? They, everything is okay. Uh, many other countries, we have this kind of cooperation. But I want to get one special point. This is a big deal. This is how we we try to s solve the problems in our borders. We have two types of, conf we adopt the bilateral, not a lot of countries in the same conference. This is a high level, this is a, uh, army staff and the other country army staff. This is one level that we try more big problems. But what really work is that one. Exchanging meeting is the same level, is the same bilateral, but the people that are in charge for this kind of conference are the troop in contact. You remember when I show you the brigades? Okay, uh, the commander of one brigade or the, the military commander of the area in the area, they have one meeting with the other command, uh, military command in the other area: Argentina, Venezuela, Ecuador. Um, Colombia, they have this meeting, for instance, Colombia, Venezuela, usually they, they have meetings with the Amazon military command. Then we have the talks with the Venezuela, we have the talks with the Colombian, everyone showed, and then we can have the two sides of, um, the opinions of the two sides separately for to, to trying to help them to solve the problems. This is. This is the last year, this is 2011. Oh no, this, yeah, 2011. What happened yesterday, last year. We have these two meetings, specific for, for intelligence. The military coordination meeting, reunion de coordenação militar, is a army level, is a high level. But this one, the RRIM, Okay, regional intelligence meeting. This is exactly the same. The troops in contact, they exchange information, intelligence information. And they ask for help. We ask for the, the help from the other country and they ask for our help and we exchange not only information but many times we exchange uh, resources, right? To have an idea about the amount of interaction, right? Argentina, all the countries, some countries, not, we don't put every, everybody there, but to have an idea. You know? These bilateral meetings, that is what really solve our problems on the board. If this is one example, what uh, we had a problem, traffic dealers, etc. usually are security problems on the border. This is how we work interagency. Here, you have the Minister of Justice and Minister of Financing. Minister of Justice, Federal <coughs> Police, Minister of Financing, the, these agents that I told you that are in charge of IRS and the other one, right? They have one operation. They call Sentinel, Sentinel, Operação Sentinel. The military, the army, this is army, have the Agat, Agata, Operation Agata. 
Okay? This Operation Nagata, we all all the what I say all the armed forces, uh, they um, are in they are subordinated. Yes, subordinated to the the army, air force, and navy on the border, and then we exchange the the Minister of Justice and Finance talk to the Minister of Defense, and then the command the area command talk with the federal police and the RFB in the area. And usually we have an operation together to try to combat the illicit, the, 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 the contraband, the ammunition problems, arms, trafficking arms, etc. To the future, what is happening? We are, this is what we have now. This is, we are, we already start to do it. We are increasing the number of border platoons in the area, especially in the Amazon area, because it's the biggest problem that we have. You know, every uh, uh, sophisticated equip equipment, GPS and everything, don't work properly inside the Amazon jungle. Okay? We are creating this. For this satellite that you can see here, the Brazil already set up the seas from. I don't know if you heard about the uh, CIVAM, the Amazon Surveillance System, is already operation, operation in the Amazon area. The seas from will integrate the Amazon Surveillance System with, with the rest of our border. We already planned, we already uh, are, we already are, have some resources fin financing. It's on project around uh, 12 billion dollars. I'm not sure. Right? <coughs> this is already working in Brazil. We have a lot of Brazilians coming here to set up and exchange information. A lot of uh, American companies and uh, many other countries' companies looking for provide the equipment. <laughs> A lot of companies providing the equipment and to Brazil to set up to finish this project. Okay, yeah, this is a command and, con and control decision support. Sensors and everything, radars. We already have the planes. I don't know if the planes came from the SIVA. And I just put here on the CIS from the political benefits is an instrument of regional integration. We already started the talkings with the other countries to participate in the CIS from. Many countries already are talking to Brazil about this. Uh, it's a tool of military cooperation neighboring armed forces and increase our presence of our states because we have a lot of empty area in Brazil, lack of population, etc. And integrate the, with the government agencies. The government agencies already are looking for us to, to, to talk to the armed forces, especially the army. The, the army is responsible for the cease from about this. Okay. Is, this is one, one sentence from our chief of staff, army chief of staff, that the border is not a division, but it is a line of union. This is how the Brazilian thinking. Many times we know everything about all the other countries, but we don't understand the other country, right? Many times when some countries say to you, yes, depending on the intonation, the yes mean yes, maybe, maybe, maybe it's no, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, many people don't understand, oh, he, he said yes, but no. Oh, can, you can do it. Yes, it's very different, right? If I'm very, very sharp, yes, of course, it's different, right? And. Finally, the Brazilian army, this is our main center. Thank you very much. Remi reminds me of the um, old story about uh, 
two people talking and one saying there's a, you know, a double negative uh, is a positive, but no double positive is a negative, and the other person says, of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Professor, Professor Griffiths from the City University of New York, in the Caribbean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. I was beginning to wonder. I don't have as many slides, and they're not as colorful as the generals, but I do have an incentive for you to listen to me and stay awake, and that is J. Cope will give everyone who sustains and keeps his eye open to the end $100 in whatever your preferred currency is. <laughs> and so, and Luigi is going to ex do the looking around to see who falls asleep and therefore will disqualify people who don't stay awake. I really want to begin by thanking Jay and Luigi for the invitation and thanking Eva and Kim for facilitating the arrangements. When Jay asked me to make a few observations in relation to Caribbean's regional security experience, I thought I'd frame my remarks in the context of what for me is an imperative for small states, what for me is an imperative of not so small states when it comes to cooperation. And that is what I call the collaboration imperative. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about, next slide please, this collaboration imperative. I want to begin with someone who you may not have known about in the context of regional Caribbean security as much because in the last decade or so, he has come to the world's limelight in another context. Ian R. Robinson, as many of you know, is the intellectual architect of the International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, sorry, ICC. But way before Ian R. Robinson propounded at the United Nations the notion of an international criminal court, he was Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago and had some very interesting experiences vis-a-vis -vis domestic security. And I thought I'd share with you perhaps as an epigraph to encapsulate what for me is a very good uh, way of articulating what I call the collaboration experience, something that Prime Minister then Robinson said in 1991 May. Let you read a few sentences which continue in the next slide. Next slide, please. This collaboration imperative, as Ian R. Robinson said, has a broader than small state character to it, has a broader than Caribbean character to it. Actually, he was not speaking solely in relation to the Caribbean. And so I'd like to use what Ian R. Robinson said two decades ago as a way of going to the next slide, framing my own remarks, and as not to disappoint Jay or Luigi or other Max or other colleagues from way back when, I thought I'll stick to a couple of letters of the alphabet. Actually, I'll use one letter of the alphabet, the letter C. I see Jay shaking his head. I think it's important as we ask the question about collaboration and regional security in the Caribbean, we might begin by asking the question about the context of the collaboration. Things generally, whether in a large state regional context or a small state regional context, don't happen just because they want to. We don't, as, as we heard Hal say, you don't have a hemisphere collaboration just because you have a hemisphere. The context needs to be there, and I think the context needs to be understood before we get it, before we go very far. But having addressed the issue of context, I think you want to come to the crux of the matter with the second C to ask, what is the nature of the configuration of this regional enterprise? And so I'll spend a minute or so sharing from my vantage point what I view in the Caribbean context, how the regional landscape manifests itself in collaboration initiatives. And I'd like to end on the 
challenges. Because I think it's true for small states and not so small states, but truer for small states, that the nature of the collaboration, the nature of the enterprise sometimes is affected in dramatic ways because of the special challenges that accrue. And so I'm hoping we can end the conversation. Next slide, please, by pondering a few of the challenges that are facing Caribbean states. Let's go to the, the next slide. It's important in my view that when you ask the question about the context of the region's collaborative imperative, you say something about the components of the context. And I think it's important to recognize that one of the components has to do with the nature of the challenges facing the states. Collaboration, context, has to do with the challenges you're facing but it's also important to ponder a little bit what exactly is the nature of the states you're dealing with. And has been said, has been said in previous panels, it is one thing to say that the Caribbean is a collection of small states. But when you peel the envelope back, you'll find that there are differences within subregions of the Caribbean. And so understanding the nature of the states with which we're dealing I think it's important not to take so many things for granted. And so we'll see that insofar as the context is concerned, there are many nuances, there are many variations that explain the context. So let's go to the next slide. I, I still take seriously something that Voltaire said way back when, and that is it's important to define the terms before you get too far in a conversation. And partly because the notion of security has been contested and has so many definitions over the decades in so many different scholarly and policy arenas, I just want to share with you my own bias. And it's a bias that I had when I first put on paper what I think is an important way of capturing what security means in the context of the region, not necessarily only the Caribbean. This is the basis on which I'm working. And it's a basis on which I'm working that says, for small states in particular, we're not looking just at military defense. In the context of Caribbean and other small states, it is not only the external arena from which you're defending potential threats and apprehensions. You've got to be just as concerned about internal security, about public security. And partly because it is not simply just national defense, when we get to the next slide, we'll see that if you were to do a survey of the contemporary policymakers and contemporary citizens of the Caribbean, you'll find that while they are both traditional and non-traditional threats, it's the non-traditional threats that present the greatest danger to the states of the Caribbean. Are there still border and territorial disputes? Yes. The dispute between Guyana and Venezuela for five-eighths of the Western Guyana is still unresolved. The dispute between Guyana and Suriname for the 15,000 square kilometers on Guyana's eastern front is still resolved. The dispute between Guatemala and Belize, as you know, is taking an interesting step forward these last couple of months. Early this year, Guyana, uh, Bahamas and the United States began to have some interesting negotiations about resolving one aspect of the U.S. Bahamian territorial dispute. So territorial and border disputes still exist. But when you list the number of clear and present dangers and ask which are the most pressing, the non-traditional ones tend to rise to the fore. And so far as those non-traditional ones are concerned, the drugs phenomenon, which as you know, is multidimensional is part of that list of top five. Crime in both its domestic and transnational manifestations is part of that list of top five. And illegal arms trafficking, both within the Caribbean and between the Caribbean and other regions, illegal arms trafficking is part of the clear and present dangers of the list. And one enduring common denominator of those three, those three threats is that they're transnational. Not amenable 
to individual country solution because of the transnationality. But they're also not amenable to individual action because they are multidimensional. What is true for Jamaica is true for the Dominican Republic, it's true for Colombia. You can't say, well, this year I'm going to take care of the illegal production of substances and then in five years I'll take care of the consumption problem. This year I'll fix the police corruption and then the next five years I'll deal with the IRS. You've got to deal with them all at the same time. It's a multidimensional arena and so that is part of the character, what I call, the next slide please, the essence of the threats. But it's important even if only as a footnote reminder to remind colleagues who particularly may not be as familiar with the Caribbean as others are that we're dealing in very practical terms with small and subordinate states. And it's not simply the question of small. It's the manifestation of how, how that small and subordinate status translate into certain limits. And I still like something that Sridhar Ramphal said way back in 1985 that I think captures, and he wasn't talking only about Caribbean states. He was talking about a commonwealth writ large, the Seychelles problem, the Vanuatu problem, the Fiji problem, the Malta problem. Small states sometimes operate as they were small boats pushed out into a turbulent sea. I'll let you read. He was capturing what for me is the subordinate status of small states. So when we go to the next slide and we remind ourselves that it is important not only to capture the nature of the threats, part of the collaborative imperative, and the nature of the states, you've got to be constantly remindful of the nature of the global arena. And what Luigi Ainauri said this morning about the hemisphere at large is true about the Caribbean with small. The Caribbean does not operate in an isolationist context. There is, we can go to the next slide fully, there is a connectivity involving nation, and sub-region, and region, and hemisphere, and the international arena. So I, I stress the importance of that because as we'll see in a minute when we come to look at some of the challenges, to think only in silo terms, this is a Caribbean or Central America, without mindfully appreciating the global context the local and the global connectivity. We didn't need to have Tom Frieden's book, The World is Flat, to remind us, but it was a powerful reminder of the connectivity. And the smaller the states are, the greater the vulnerability to matters beyond their own region, matters beyond their own hemispheres. I think it's important, as we ask the question about the imperative, we remind ourselves what we're talking about, who we're talking about, and the environment about which we speak. Next slide, please. So, so let's move to the second question quickly because I only have two hours remaining for my uh, 20 minutes speech. What are we talking about, next slide please, when we talk about collaboration? Well, I think it's important to remember, next slide please, we're talking about a mixed landscape of engagement. We're talking about a landscape in which there is bilateral and multilateral, much as what we heard about Brazil in the context of from what the general just said. And I like to describe the multilateral engagement in which Caribbean states participate and Caribbean stakeholders participate as a set of zones that overlap. And I'll show you a graphic in a minute that I designed a few years ago to capture that. But it's important to keep in mind that the Caribbean engagement is not only by Caribbean states. There are important stakeholders that have geopolitical and other interests in the Caribbean, and those stakeholders, not for altruism, but for self-interest, are engaged in the engagement landscape of the region. When we go to the next slide, I try to capture in one graphic the reality there. I hope I don't press the wrong button. I did press the wrong button. Can you go back? I'm not going to use a term of art that the general used, but can you just go back? Uh, <laughs> Go back to the previous slide. It's important for me to be able to remember 
that their overlapping engagements with this Eastern Caribbean, with the Caribbean, with the hemisphere, and their broader systemic connections. We know that within the subregion, the regional security system is an important player. Uh, I did an article two decades ago of the, the first 10 years of the RSS, and I said something then, which I think is still true. The RSS is an important insurance policy. Never fully paid up, but you better not have no RSS, you're worse off than have it. You have within the overlapping subregion and region, the Association of Caribbean Commissioners of Police, they're meeting as we speak in the Bahamas. It brings together a wide variety, not just Anglophone Caribbean, uh, Lusophone Caribbean, uh, Dutch Caribbean as well. And what I decided to try to capture here is the fact that within this shared sub-regional regional space, you've got a number of not ostensibly Caribbean initiatives, but initiatives that are fundamental to what the partnerships involving the Caribbean is all about. The Caribbean National Nation Security Conference, Trade Winds, which is going beyond two decades, a collaborative interoperability engagement involving SOUTHCOM as the lead agency with a variety of, of countries. I think they're meeting in Barbados next week for Trade Wind 2012. But I think it's important to understand that it is not simply the United States and Caribbean partners, that you've got European Union partners, you've got Canada playing significant roles, and sometimes Canada's role is underappreciated because there's not too much blowing of smoke and claiming of credit. It's a lot of working behind the scenes, getting things done without necessarily wanting the world to know who pays for it. And so it's important as we think of what's Caribbean in terms of engagement, not to focus only on the state partners from the Caribbean, but to see what are those broader stakeholders, some within the region, some within the hemisphere, some outside the hemisphere, who because of a variety of interests, coincidental and other, find it necessary in the context of the global environment, find it necessary in the context of the transnationality of crime to engage with the Caribbean countries. Let's go to the next slide, please. I'm not gonna spend time on these slides. We can just go to skip the next two slides, but I thought I would, for those of you who are interested later on, just gave a couple of indications of some of those regional organizations and allow you to see who are some of the part participating states. Be surprised to know the extent to which certain Hispanic South American countries are intimately involved in the Anglophone Caribbean partnerships. Again, sometimes like Canada, funding behind the scenes, not taking too much credit for it. So let's end on the, on the question of challenges. Next slide, please. By now you will realize I like the number three. And I think there are three, at least three challenges that come to mind when you ask, what are some of the challenges that these partnerships within the Caribbean, across the Caribbean and the hemisphere, funded by Caribbean and non-Caribbean stakeholders, what are some of the challenges that are being faced? Let's go to the next slide. Remember my reference to the fact that you're talking about small states, we can put everything up? Well, the nature of the smallest, we can put everything up, manifests itself in having a perennial challenge of capabilities. And again, while security issues are part of the clear and present danger landscape, Caribbean states have got much more than security issues to attend to. They still have to find resources to do something for housing. Still have to find resources to do something for education. Still have to find resources to take care of portable water supply. And so when you put in the matrix, their small size, the multiplicity of challenges on the national front, you find that the capabilities challenge sometimes undermine the ability to exercise sovereignty in a positive way. And that is not simply a theoretical challenge, it's a practical challenge that manifests itself on a daily basis sometimes in relation to getting things done. I was quipping earlier at lunch that one of the things that Ambassador Portales 
said that I embrace fully is the multiplicity of summits. Sometimes people are not sure which summit they're at. And sometimes some states are not able to get to those summits unless somebody else pays the bill. That is a practical, real challenge. It's a capability. How can you exercise sovereignty if you're not there? How can you exercise sovereignty if you don't understand the issues and make adequate representation, negotiating on your own behalf? So for me, the capabilities issue is not a simple, it's just a small state. When you drill down to understand what smallness means, it means limitations on both internal sovereignty and external sovereignty. Let's go to the next slide. But it's not simply, next slide please, not simply a matter of capabilities. Linked to the challenge of capabilities is what I call the challenge of institutionalization. And it's no consolation to the Dominican Republic for it to say that Jamaica has the same challenge or that Paraguay has the challenge. It's a challenge what I call the platitude syndrome. There is a tendency in many parts of our hemisphere, including in the Caribbean, to act as though when you give a big speech by El Presidente or you sign a treaty, the problem is solved. And the question of follow-up takes maybe last stage. The question of passing the domestic legislation to implement this treaty you sign, somebody forgets to do it. Worse when it comes to evaluating. Who wants to evaluate what you've done in the last five years? And so you have a challenge of what I call institutionalization, the necessity to go beyond the platitudes to figure out how do you translate what the prime minister, the president said, into meaningful executable programs. And then you evaluate those programs, especially if you are depending upon partners to fund them. The partners are not going to constantly give you money because you want it. They're going to ask the question for their own domestic constituencies, well, what about that hundred bucks I gave you five years ago? What's happened to it? That for me is part of the institutionalization challenge. But I'd like to also remind you at the end that what I call the two-dimensional cooperation challenge. Not simply cooperating between and among states is a perennial headache. Cooperation within by agencies within the same government. Sometimes you ask, the phones are not working, the email does not work, I mean, why is there no communication between one agency and another? And again, it's no consolation to say that bigger states have those problems. Small states can ill afford the difficulty, the challenge of not coordinating well, because the net result is you don't have enough resources to keep wasting and your stakeholders don't necessarily have the luxury of your explanations or excuses to apologize for. So let's go to the next slide finally. And I thought I would, in some respects, end where I began. And in the process, make Hal Klepak happy by throwing in some French there. Because what A. R. Robinson said in 1991 has an enduring quality to it. And that is, whether it's 1981 or 1991 or 2001 or 2011, the collaboration has an imperative to it because of the same issues I referred to. And I like the way in which the current Prime Minister of Trinidad, a couple of weeks ago in Cartagena, captured that imperative. And this is what she said in her opening speech at the Sixth Summit of the Americas. Like Trinidad of 2012, Trinidad of many years ago is the lead agency, the lead nation state on security matters for CARICOM. And as you know, CARICOM is no longer just an English-speaking club. Suriname is part of CARICOM. Haiti is part of CARICOM. The Dominican Republic is an observer member of CARICOM. The issue of transnational organized crime holds particular significance for CARICOM. Crime, security, and safety is one of the major challenges facing our countries today. It's a multifaceted, it's a transnational pandemic requiring collective effort. Not just Caribbean collective effort, I would add. The notion of being a brother's keeper is not simply theoretical in the context of Caribbean small states. 
And so I thought I would end by sharing with you what for me is a redeeming, continuously fixed element of the nature of Caribbean states, continues to be a fixed nature of the challenges that are faced by those states, and that collaboration in that context is not something simply that is, is desired. Collaboration actually is imperative, it's a necessity. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have about half an hour for uh, uh, discussion, questions, speeches in the form of questions, questions in the form of speeches. Uh, I'd ask each of you to identify yourselves and direct your question. Um, but uh, I'll just, I was allow myself the chair's prerogative to be provoked by the last speaker. It seems that every generation has to learn uh, the lesson anew. Um, I was reminded that uh, the Soviet foreign minister of the 1930s used to say that peace is indivisible. Uh, it's not exactly news that dealing with transnational crime requires uh, a collective or collaborative approach, but we all have silos. Um, as many silos as there are individual countries and then some. So, uh, first question, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Walter Amador from Honduras, current student at the College of International Security Affairs here at the National Defense University. And my question is for Major General Walter Braga. We have the same names, so no, no problem, we understand each other. Walter to Walter. And believe me, your English is better than mine, so no. don't, don't worry about that. You're right, sir. Uh, yes, sir, I, I know you were talking about the border strategy in Brazil, but taking advantage of your presence here, and since we, a small country in Central America, are having a lot of problems with security and high levels of violence. We have been compelled to use the military within the realm of police activities. So if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, in Brazil, you, the, the last year you conducted uh, very important operations in the favelas using the army assets. So what would you cons consider has been the most important factor for using the military? Has this operation been, been successful in Brazil using the military within the area of police operations. How have you solved the idea that it is important to use the army in this kind of operations? Okay, thank you for your question because a lot of people ask me sometimes about, uh, usually the Americans, here in America, they came to me to ask about uh, the big events and this operation in the favelas, right? Uh, it's important to know that everything that we, the armed forces do it, we have uh, with the support of our constitution. And to the army, to the armed forces, especially the army, working inside one poor community like the favela, uh, first of all, the only one that can order, give the order for us to go there is the president. The second one, the intervention, has to be episodic. We have to have one day to start and one day to finish. We, we are not uh, one frame, open frame to, to work in the favela. The, another thing very important is the state government has have to go to the president or to the federal government and ask for, we exhaust our security resources, we need the federal, go the, the federal support. And then we plan everything. And when the armed forces uh, start the operation, all the security forces in the state uh, it will be under my command, uh, on the, my command, the command of the armed forces, right? And it's very complicated. It's not easy because, you know, they are not enemy. They are Brazilians like us. And we are not preparing for, usually for, um, law enforcement. We are preparing to kill, to, 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 to fight, to combat, right? 
Uh, one thing that's easy for us, because exactly what I told before, many times we understand very well the situation there. Because you have to take in your mind that our operation inside the favela in Brazil is not the same operation that we do the, in the favela or the poor community in Haiti. It's different. The situation is different, right? But it's not an easy job, and we have all, to have all this background support to work there. Right? And it's doing well, but we are finished now. You know, I believe that June, I have a Brazilian, June or July will be the last month. July. July we are finished. Uh, is, this one was the longest uh, intervention that we have in one Brazilian area inside the Brazil. Uh, it's around one year we'll be in the favela there in Rio de Janeiro. Right? I don't know if I answer, but we can talk later. Julie Blaze from Principia College, and my question is for Dr. Griffith, and it has to do with, um, given the context of the Western Hemisphere in the same neighborhood as the United States, what's your metric for small? My measurement for small has two dimensions to it. It has a population dimension, and it has a geographic dimension. And because of the range of states within the Caribbean basin, uh, I'm using at the lower end of small, millions of 10. But when you put the geographic configuration into the matrix, I'm also looking at states that are not in the millions of square miles. What it means is that within that matrix, you have small a la St. Kitts Nevis, with four to 6,000 people. But for me, given what the limitations of geography means, I also view Haiti with 11 million people as small. So you've got a range of what smallness is, and when you take the delimitating character of size and population, you find a variety of limits on what capacity of the state can be. Whether the capacity of the state has to do with educational objectives being delivered adequately, whether the capacity of the state has to do with law enforcement. One of the interesting realities of all Caribbean states in the, in the archipelago, except Cuba, The security deficits in this part of the state are such that in some places you've got more private security than state security. Not only in numerical terms is that deficit manifesting itself, you find the deficit manifesting itself in capabilities. Sometimes you have more assets in the part of the private security than the assets of the state. So if you take the geographic and the population and put them into a matrix and say, what do these represent in terms of a capacity of a nation state to manage its affairs? Sovereignty both externally, sovereignty internally. For me, whether it is Cuba or St. Kitts or Dominican Republic, we're talking about small states. Uh, Thomas Costum, a professor here at CISA. Uh, in 1980, there was a, a conference here in Washington, the American Political Science Association. And in a session like this, uh, one individual asked a question, and there was a double affirmation, yeah, yeah. His question was, well, let's suppose that there is a unification of Germany. And it was almost like, well, let's change subject, but this is not going to happen. And we, they didn't even talk about you know, the end of the Cold War. So what I want to challenge the panel is, well, let's not look back, but let's kind of look forward. And I would like to uh, uh, maybe use as a hook this uh, um, comment that Ivla just made about the inability or the incapacity of the state. Everything we talk about here in terms of the threats or the dangers, the problems, there is the big elephant in the room is the issue of sovereignty. 
And today, when we talk about small countries, there is a new generation that realizes the limit of small country sovereignty. In, in, in fact, we can say that what's happening today in Europe with Greece is a discussion about you know, where the European Union wants to go in terms of sovereignty, who pays the bill. So what I would like to hear from the panel is what are your thoughts regarding the possibilities of the future where we may see small states or any type of state folding into some other large unit, especially because of the limits that current states have in dealing with so-called transnational issues. Thank you. That's very naughty of you, Ivla. Uh, <laughs> give me that one. I def oh, age. <laughs> you said age, did you? Well, that would certainly be looking uh, forward. I, I think it's, a, it's an old issue, isn't it? Because uh, when you do collaborate and are willing to yield sovereignty, it tends to be because things are going very badly indeed. And let's hope they're not, go they're not going to go as badly as they might. But I think one would be foolish not to recall that even a country as large as Colombia, not very many years ago, uh, polls are only as good as polls can be, but that a very large percentage of Colombians said that a U.S. solution would be acceptable to them, even if the Colombian government disagreed with the U.S. military solution to the problems of the country. In Cuba a few years ago, among urban youth, you might well have heard uh, the same thing. And certainly even in Mexico, a country with ma magnificent traditions of respect for its own sovereignty and for others, uh, the polls that the El Excelsior has run about would you be willing to see your country taken over by another country if that guaranteed both security in the streets and prosperity, the percentage was over 50. Um, so that I think we would be foolish not to realize that we're dealing with a serious issue that, Tomas, you have, you have certainly raised here. Um, but surely that should stimulate us to do more about cooperation now uh, and it should stimulate the greater powers that perhaps aren't all that interested. This is not an imperial era in the same sense anymore, or if it is, perhaps it's closer to Rome than to Britain in the 19th century. Countries are not actually all that keen on taking over problem countries and incorporating them into the, their own political entities anymore. It just adds to your difficulties rather than, uh, rather than uh, limits them or reducing them. Uh, so I think it's in everyone's interest to see that I think you're bang on on the question of a new generation, for example. We've seen it in Quebec on the question of, uh, of separatism. Uh, young people are not nearly as, consider uh, as troubled um, uh, by these issues if they feel that real issues of access to jobs, access to prosperity, access to security can be ensured by some other reorganization of political structures, uh, they're more willing to consider those things than perhaps a generation such as mine raised on monarchs and flags and national anthems and the rest of it. So I think we would be wise to have that, I hope, to a stimulus to sovereign countries doing it in a sovereign way and dealing with issues of this kind. Because if we don't, then perhaps we will have to find some kind of imperial relationship that neither the imperial head nor the imperial uh, provinces will be terribly keen on. Uh, just one opinion. Uh, we can only. I, I can speak in Portuguese because uh, it's a Brazilian, right? <laughs> no, it's a joke. Uh, I, I just want. I, I believe that we have just to take care about this kind of observation because you saw uh, Germany was a country that was divided by the by, by war. We have countries in Africa that they just put a line and then they divided the countries. Maybe these countries want to be together or or it's a small country, but. But you believe that when we talk about small countries, we have to take care about the, their, their own personality, uh, their own history, the, 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 these countries has, has everything, uh, have one, one background, a big background. Because, or I agree with the doctor here that um, some kind of position like this could be taken as an imperialism position. 
uh, just uh, the big country want to, no, no, you are not enough, have not a strong economy to do it, and then, or not uh, law enforcement, etc. And then we have to put together, we have to take care about this position. One of the realities of our contemporary arena is that whether you like it or not, whether we embrace it or not, sovereignty has been an evolving concept. You know, when the Treaty of Westphalia was signed, establishing what became the basis for sovereignty as nation state, you didn't have the kinds of transnational threats that really undermine and make foolish the pretense of sovereignty in a part of some states. And so I think what we've come to realize, reluctantly so on the part of smaller states that have recent political freedom, is that there's always a tenuous balance between the claim to sovereignty and the exercise of sovereignty. To what extent are you sovereign when you can control who goes through your borders and with what impunity? To what extent are you sovereign when cyber intelligence and cyber warfare uh, is prosecuted in your nation, you don't even know about it? To what extent are you sovereign if you aren't able to have the capacity to negotiate at international forums? And so I think over time, there is less of an overt preoccupation, maybe is the wrong word, with sovereignty to the part of some states, because many are coming to realize that it is no longer simply the multinational corporations, the big bad guys of the 60s and 70s, who've been making rings around sovereign small states. It is now a combination of different kinds of non-state actors. In the Caribbean context, the notion of sovereignty has a peculiarity to it in that the recency of election, the recency of independence, starting in the Anglophone region with Jamaican Trinidad that have their 50th anniversary this year. It was like many of us who have kids and you know, when they're 18, they want their own apartment, but can they pay the whole the bill? No, mommy, can you still pay the car note? And so you don't want to give up. You want to have your freedom, but you really can't pay for that freedom. The notion of the necessity for regional organizations as a way of helping to bolster that sovereignty, that notion still exists. But you still find reluctance because people want their own independence of thought and independence of action the reluctance to embrace fully the regional that is one way of at least mitigating against the totally deleterious impact of quote unquote the bad guys who are exercising sovereignty in a way which you perhaps would prefer not to know. And so I think it's only a matter of time before particularly the small jurisdictions in the Eastern Caribbean come to the realization, and I got myself in trouble about in 1996, I did a study for Jay, when I made the point that it's going to be one of the realities of the 21st century, when many countries in the Eastern Caribbean in particular come to realize that the individual sovereignty designs that they have no longer is feasible. Because when you think of the economics of maintaining your sovereignty, when you think of the security deficits that come because of the capacity limitations, you have to ask the question, are you interested in the sovereignty just for symbolic reasons, or is there a substance that goes to the sovereignty? It's a very vexed question, Thomas, and it becomes vexer for smaller, more recently independent states. But I think the winds of global change are suggesting the foolhardiness of some small states not wanting to join to, with others. And it doesn't have to be totally becoming one United States of the Caribbean. I hope at least my, my grandson will be able to see that. But I think making full use of the regional institutions, helping to mitigate against the damage of your individual nations because you have limitations of security forces, you have limitations of your funding agencies, you've got limitations of stakeholders who know they want to give, but they have their own challenges. And they can give you as much as you would like, and for as long as you would like. It's an interesting point that you, you make, because um, 
not so very long ago, 2001 to be precise, um, the Organization of American States was the gold standard among international organizations and regional organizations in the field of counterterrorism. It alone had uh, a regional counterterrorism bureaucracy. The European Union did not have one. The ASEAN did not have one. The African Union did not have one. The Arab League did not have one. Um, and so it takes time for organizations to develop uh, institutional responses to new or, or newly understood threats. And now all of these organizations uh, has a counter-terrorist bureaucracy uh, of sorts, even the IMF and the World Bank, which thought that they had nothing to teach anybody about terrorism until they were reminded that Maybe they knew something about financial transactions and could help banking systems uh, develop ways of tracking terrorist finance. Did they get into the terrorist game? Can you hear me? Yes. Bob Pellegrin, U.S. Army South. Uh, regarding uh, the topic of border security, uh, with, of course, the factors being uh, ungoverned space, uh, and uh, porous borders, and in, in, for example, in, in the case of Central America, the difficulties with uh, the corruption in the police, so that it presents uh, special challenges. And I was wondering for Brazil, uh, you know, has Brazil thought of, of uh, having a civilian agency and, and, and the military being in support of the civilian agency to support the, the, the border security, instead of the army being the lead? Because, uh, it would seem that it would be more advantageous to have a civilian lead so you can hand it back over to them when you, the, the, you pacified the border and then you retreat back to the more traditional um, missions. Thank you for your question. It's, uh, it's, one, it's good because I can present one thought. Sorry. One thought that I was uh, having now. Uh, I, I had a chance to work in, a, in the President of the Republic in the big interagency system. And what I learned there is everyone wants to share information. But I want to share your information, not my information. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is the big problem when we work interagency in Brazil. There, okay, uh, is the confidence. This is the reason that the bilateral meetings with the people that are on the ground, on the border, is very important. Because I will not share information if I don't know the general here, right? If, I, if the, the information is very sensitive, let's say that. Usually the Brazilian, the Brazilian armed forces, when they work with interagencies, especially federal police and the IRS and, and the others, uh, we give them uh, the support of intelligence and logistical support. This is the main support, operational, to go to fight, it's uh, one, one separate thing like uh, we ha what's happened in favela in Rio uh, this year, last year, but usually we just give them the support, intelligent support and uh, uh, logistical support. And it's very difficult. We have to know very well the people that we are sharing this kind of information because many times what you said it's true. Uh, many times people are not. We we cannot trust in this guy that are talking to us. This is the reason that is very important to know, uh, have a long relation with these people. Our agencies, intelligence agents, are always talk interagencies, officers, intelligence officers to know the guy and everything. When we share information, information we, are, we can trust them. I don't know if I answer your question, but all right. So, sorry, say again. I, I didn't hear the last one. The, only the end. Will there, will when there you ever, have a border patrol. In the long run, the way ahead in the future, will there ever be a civilian border patrol, or is it always going to be the military? No, we, we, usually we, have this, we are having this on the border now, uh, but not all the time. The problem is, uh, now, nowadays on the border, we have the support of the law, the law support, 
to, to have uh, law enforcement power, right? But we don't do it all the time. We are not like a policeman on the border. We have some operations, we set up everything with this guy, and then we have the patrols with them and everything. Because, you know, uh, take care of the border is not an army um, role. It's a federal police role in Brazil, right? But we have this, I would say, this frame of support by the law, just in case if it's necessary, the police cannot, is not enough because the border is very, it's a big border like I show you, right? They don't have um, enough resource, power men, resource, everything, to do it. And then many times we give them the support, but we need the, 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 the law to support us, or we, they can put us on a, in a trial. This is the reason that. But this has already happened in Brazil. Uh, Major Pinto, U.S. Army South. Uh, this is for uh, General Braganeto. My question is regarding the mission in, in Haiti. I understand that uh, a couple of months ago you guys announced that you can reduce your, your force by three. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I apologize. Can I get five in Portuguese or in general? No. No? Ah, tamo. Okay. Well, anyways, I understand that the mission in Haiti, you're going to reduce the number by about approximately 300. I also understand that uh, Brazil eventually wants to pull out of Haiti. But I've also heard in, the, in large discussion that if you do pull out, the, uh, that Haiti will just collapse back into the same chaos it was in previously. Therefore, putting you guys in sort of a quagmire of which I'm pretty familiar with, with the missions in Afghanistan and in Iraq. How do you feel, what do you see as the future for, uh, for the mission in Munista? Uh, I have this experience in, in Timor, right? And uh, the problem is we have, now the problem in Haiti is not, not they have the security problem, but it's not uh, only the security problem. We have to try to help them to develop the country. And what Brazil is, have, is doing now, the Brazil is uh, reinforce the engineer troops we are sending more, uh, put our agencies, we try to commitment, to get one commitment of our agencies to help Haiti. And we withdraw the force when the Haiti set up their security, security law enforcement, what will happen, okay? But, you know, uh, Haiti is not a Brazilian problem. It's, um, a global problem, everybody has to, to help Haiti, right? And the problem nowadays, uh, security now, my, it, they still haven't, but not, not like in the past. The problem now is how to rebuild uh, and gave them the sources the, or the resources to do it by themselves, right? And we are trying to do this. We are trying to teach them. We are sending teachers, professors. We are putting our engineer troops to, to, to give the, the, the minimal infrastructure, help them not to do this, but help them, the infrastructure. But this is a problem. When the army start to work a lot, the civilians start to complain that we are taking their job. This is a, we are trying to balance, right? Jay, do you want the last word? Okay, um, I've lo I really like your term, the collaboration imperative. And uh, you provided a very good example of how the small states in the Caribbean have uh, tried, to f tried to react to that. And General Braganetto, in a way, you talked about a collaboration imperative along the border, that it is an imperative for Brazil with so many neighbors on the border that uh, it really does need to work together with its neighbor, bilaterally more than anything else, to try to manage what happens on the border. Th these are two very good examples of the imperative, but I wonder if it can go a step further, and I come back to our, our paper writer, Hal. I mean, is there the ability, looking to the future, of these sub-regions that see a, an imperative, 
large countries that see an imperative to work together for a regional security solution? Is there a collective way for these to come together? Can small regions collaborate with other regions? Can there be a better dialogue? Uh, can we learn one from the other? Uh, Sedema was listed, the Caribbean's uh, disaster management organization, has a great deal to teach other countries, but will other countries feel the imperative to listen to them? So is there a future of these organizations uh, working together toward the greater good? I wish I could remember my Latin a little better than I, and my, I'm so old that Latin was something we spoke in the streets, we didn't learn it in the school. Uh, but uh, it seems, I think imperative is a really good word, as, as you say, because it, 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 it pushes us, and indeed it's about being pushed towards collaboration. We have to collaborate. If we have an imperative to collaborate, it's not a choice we make if it's an imperative. Um, and of course, there is clearly no such imperative hemispherically. If we said there was, we would be flying in the face of everything we see uh, uh, sub-regionally. Uh, one could argue there wasn't either in 1942 or in the Cold War. There was a political um, uh, context in which there was a drive to, or more reasons to do so than not uh, to do so. Uh, my suspicion is it's not a good moment. Uh, my suspicion is that South America needs time. It needs time to define itself, uh, to feel sufficiently confident that it can deal with the big boys because it wants to be a big boy uh, under leadership of uh, already a big boy. Um, uh, and it needs some time uh, to uh, feel its strength, to move forward. It needs some of that time of real independence uh, that Ivlaw was, I think, referring to um, as now this very new idea. Because whatever historians and political scientists and social scientists say about Latin America as a false concept, over its century and three quarters, it has got some some uh, wind in its sails, uh, whereas the concept of South America, of course, is entirely new. Uh, we can search desperately uh, for references to such a grouping as an identity, and we will not find very much before very recent years indeed. So my suspicion is it's not a good moment until they feel more firm on their own feet, and where we also have built the confidence, built back the confidence, if you like, through uh, uh, policies from uh, Washington and from other countries, including Ottawa, uh, towards them that we're really talking about cooperation and not about yet again a return to domination, which from their perspective is what they've, uh, what they've known in most cases in, in the past. So I don't think this is going to be easy. I do, however, believe in a habit of cooperation. I think if one doesn't do a lot together, but one does something together, if one doesn't demolish the old system, but merely understand that it's not going to do so much. It's a bit way, uh, the way I feel about ALBA, that however annoyed I get uh, on a daily basis, if, if I remember that this is a revolutionary moment and that patience usually pays off because revolutions slow down and get a little less excited and you can eventually live with them even though it doesn't look like it in the short run. Uh, the same, I think, for the, for the system as a whole. We, we really need to build confidence we, and we need to inject what dynamism we can uh, into this, and this requires some policy changes. I've never found Latin America anti-American, for example. I think it's an extremely uh, pro-American region, rather like the Middle East. It's anti-specific policies that the United States adopts, but in no way is it culturally uh, inclined to anti-Americanism uh, from what I have seen in my life. But uh, a new attitude, I think, to ALBA, uh, nuanced, uh, whether one likes it or not, uh, a Cuba policy that doesn't look like bullying, whether it is or bullying or not, but one which doesn't look like it anymore because Cuba's importance is symbolic. It's not, uh, it's not its size. Maybe looking at mutual assistance packs another time to find a more uh, 
friendly way of, uh, of phrasing them and just looking at our institutions. But I think if we can continue, uh, sorry, if we can start anew, not with necessarily with institu new institutions, but with a new look, the same uh, change of, uh, of mindset, uh, we can go a long way. But if our expectations are of dramatic acceptance that we're all going in the same uh, way, I don't think we'll get very far. But look, for example, at drugs, and then I'll shut up. Uh, look for drugs. Not very many years ago, my favorite graffiti, even though I don't agree with the view, was a wonderful turn of phrase on the subjunctive, painted in black in front of the U.S. Embassy in Bogota. I'm sure some of you saw it, which was, everybody has Spanish, I'm sure, la solución, you know what the problem is, but la solución, colon, que usa, no use lo que usa. Uh, in, in other words, the, the solution is an American problem. The drugs is an American problem, exclusively an American problem, and we're the victims, not the perpetrators of, of, the, uh, of this, this criminal situation. There would be very few people who would argue that now. Uh, so that patients, I think, can do a, a lot uh, working steadily together. That's my Canadian example as well. We weren't always in world wars with the Axis. We are most of the time just working together, mutual respect building up slowly but sh surely. So I think patience is the key in building confidence. Uh, I, I believe that um, the big, let's say, the big reunions, uh, they have a good horizon in front of us, of them. But they just have to take care to, to get some practical results from these reunions. Many times we have reunions just to set up the date of and the local of the next reunion, right? And uh, we have to, to get some results on this. I'm, I'm thinking as a military, right? This is the reason that the Brazil decided we have the big one to give us the direction to work, and uh, the troops on the ground, face to face, talk to them, talk to each other, to trying to fix the, what they need, what they need. But I, I believe in this, the, the organisms, the, the big organisms in the area will give us good results. I think in all the challenges that we face, we ought to take comfort in a couple of things we heard about our hemisphere and our many sub-regions this morning. Significant among which is the fact that we're a relatively peaceful region. When you leave the transnational organized crime, not undervaluing the importance of what it results in, when you conscious of what's happening in parts of Mexico, conscious of what's happening in parts of the Anglophone Caribbean, parts of what, conscious of what's happening in the Dominican Republic, but still conscious that much progress has been made. And so as we think of the imperatives either for sub-region connectivity with region and hemisphere, I think it's important that policy leaders and people who have influential voices to communicate the benefits of what we have with constituencies because a lot of the drive for something different is coming from domestic political constituencies that are looking to see the results. And sometimes the complicated nature of the global environment, people aren't able to see the connectivity between what's happening in millions of miles away and in their own regions and they're begging for interpretation. I don't know that we can leave the interpretation simply to the media that is interested in selling print and space by accentuating the sensationalistic. But we need to be reminding our constituencies whether in the academic policy, military, law enforcement arenas, that there's a lot of things in which we should take proud, pride in achievements. And the imperatives are going to be a function of three things. The imperatives are going to be a function of threats we're going to be having. You know, I, never, I, I don't ever want to live in a world where there's nothing exciting going on. And some of the threats are exciting. I remember speaking to District 7 of the Coast Guard about two decades ago, and one officer said to me, Professor Griffin, when are we going to win the drug war? I said, 
think about it. Do you really want to win the drug war? He said, oh shit, I almost used a term of art that uh, the general use. The nature of bureaucracies, once they're created, is going to have uh, an important decision-making voice about why are we here. And I think it's the voices of people like us here who need to tell constituencies. Sometimes, yes, it looks bad all the way over there, but compared to what it used to be 10, 15 years ago, let's accentuate the positives. So I think we can accentuate the positives of saying we need to push the collaboration imperative envelopes at all levels, knowing that there is not unanimity politically in the hemisphere. I mean, Hugo Chavez doesn't see the thing the same way as Portia Simpson, doesn't necessarily think, think the same way as Barack Obama, but it's a hemisphere where we can build on so many things that already have been accomplishments. The imperative envelope just needs to be pushed. Please join me in thanking our panelists. That concludes this panel. <laughs>